John with RipeWave Audio back again with Denon's latest AV receiver, the AVRX6800H, which sells for just under $3,500. And this is part six in our series. And this one's called Odyssey Mult EQX versus Dirac Live Bass Control, or said more plainly, how do we get Mult EQX to sound as good as Dirac Live Bass Control? And that's what our aim is with this video. If you've missed any of the first five videos, you can go back and view them. We've covered everything from the initial unboxing and uh, configuration to getting it set up with Dirac Live and getting bass control, which is that new option which Denon and Marantz are providing. We compared it against the built-in Odyssey. And then in the last video, we started to play with Mult EQX. And we did that first tutorial run through, but now we're doing a deeper dive on comparing it against Dirac Live and how do we get there. Before we get into this video, I do want to talk about Marantz's latest announcement. They have announced the Cinema 30 will be available soon. It's not clear if some retailers are able to provide it yet. I try to put it into the cart from Marantz's site and had failures. Whether I try to buy the black one or the silver one, they said no units were in stock, but this kind of gives you the illusion that uh, it is. I'm going to try calling them and see if we can get one of these uh, sent to us and Maybe it works better than their website, which was operating really slow last weekend and the last few days. So we'll see about that. We start off with these main differences between Odyssey Melt EQX and Dirac Live Room Correction, particularly with bass control. There is a big price difference, especially as you start adding in bass control. And you take into the fact that Odyssey is full bandwidth, and that's the only option at $200 or just $1 short of that. And then for Dirac, you've got to pay extra to get the full bandwidth and then pay more to get your base control. But of course, Odyssey isn't doing to base control or base management what Dirac is doing. Also, we point out here that Odyssey, though, is only a Windows-based application with Dirac Live is available for Mac users. So if you are a Mac user, you're not going to be able to use Mult EQ unless you get a Windows machine. And the new M1, then uh, the new M1 computers from Mac and the new Apple M1 computers uh, can't run it even in a Windows compatible mode. So uh, some limitations there, but you know, on the surface, these are the differences. Now we're using our same test setup for measuring the results after running through these calibration tools. What are they actually putting out to us in the main listening position? Now, some of you have written to me and said, hey, you should use multiple measurement positions and average them together. And yes, that's the right way to do it because uh, you get you account for variations in the seating positions, particularly if you're moving your head slightly, as we all do. We don't just stay stationary. So yes, a good tip, but for this quick take on all this, we're using just the single position. This will come in the future as we uh, explore further calibration techniques, and that's a focus of ours this year. So we have a test plan on how we're going to do this. So if we're gonna take a look, we're doing those measurements with the UMIC-1 and REW, and we're gonna compare the current calibrations, Dirac Live and Mult EQX from Odyssey. We know from right now, just listening, that the Dirac Live results were better than the default settings for Mult EQX. Of course, Dirac, we did go in and replace the target curve with a Harman curve, but it still sounded better before we even did that. But the measurements what we have, the ones we're starting with for comparison, all have that plus 4 dB Harman curve imported into the Dirac Live tool, and that is the target curve we use. So what we decided to do is, can we take some of those settings? We didn't feel that Odyssey had the right crossovers in there, the right cutoffs for the low frequency, the auto settings, yes, nice and convenient, but if they're not giving you 
accurate settings, then the convenience is all lost. What we decided to do is let's try to take the target curve and the crossovers and the curtains and the trims and the distances that we have in Dirac, which we know sound good when run through the Dirac algorithms, and try to apply them to Odyssey Mult EQX. Take a stop each step along the way and measure to see if we're improving or not improving by making that light configuration in Mult EQX. So we're going to start with the plus four Harman curve. We're going to import the same file into Odyssey Mult EQX. Then we're going to take all the crossover low cut settings and put those in, followed by the base management settings. There's a couple places where you have to do this in Odyssey Mult EQ. It's not just a single place like in Dirac. Get those curtains in the same place. We're doing our corrections on the same frequency range as we're applying in Dirac. Not more, not less. And then seeing if the trims, if matching those uh, make a difference. Now we know the way that Dirac does the trims is different than the way Odyssey goes about it. So absolute in Odyssey and relative trims in Dirac. That we suspect isn't going to produce that great of results because of the difference in how they go about it. And then the distances, here's another difference you're doing a time delay in Dirac versus a measurement in feet or meters in Odyssey. And you'd have to do some conversion to make those compatible. We'll talk about that. Now, we don't have time in this video to do a few extra things, but we have on our future list is to attempt to improve upon what Dirac is doing and then compare for time alignment. We haven't gone into time alignment comparisons as of yet. So let's start and look what we're getting with Odyssey with the default settings. And here I did a plot that takes the left and the right channel of our front main speakers and measures those. Uh, you know, this is as far as we're going with time alignment. We can see here that the left and the right speakers are not tracking each other. So we know that there's a time alignment issue with the current Odyssey Mult EQX settings. Now, if we compare the results of the Mult EQ X32, which we get from the Denon uh, in, internal uh, Odyssey, which is the orange plot, and compare it against Dirac Live and Dirac Live Base Control with a plus 4 dB curve, you know, we saw better results with Dirac Live. And then when we ran it through with the Mult EQ X, versus what's built into the processor, we didn't get a lot of improvement from Odyssey. And here it is against the best results from Dirac Live using base control and the plus 4 dB Harman curve, the best results we've got to date. Now there's probably some things I need to correct that and I see that dip just after 200 Hertz. So that's something we can always look into later. So we, what we did was we went back into Dirac Live and we captured, we recorded all those settings that we got when we did our filters and our calibrations with the Rack Live and the Denon X6800. So here's where we had the curtains for the subwoofers, and then we take a look at the front speakers, and we see the curtains, but not just the curtains, where that crossover point is coming in at 70 hertz. And it seemed like the Rack with our speakers, even though they dipped down much further below 70 hertz, they like to put the crossover around 70, and we saw that with uh, the other speakers. So the center speaker, the front wide's a little higher up on the crossover at 91 hertz. Uh, and notice the curtains changing a little bit with each speaker. And then we had the surround left and right, back to 70 hertz there. Same with the surround back, 70 hertz, our first row of ceiling height speakers at 70 hertz, although it did have for the rear uh, ceiling speakers at 77 hertz. So those were the values plus the curtains. We recorded those for the highs and the lows. And then we put them into this table. Now we were able to capture the time delay by looking into the Denon receiver itself and saw the milliseconds and it's measured in milliseconds for 
Dirac live calibrations. But we're able to convert that to a distance. So time delay is related to the speed of sound, which is 1,125 feet per second. And if you apply this formula, we take your time delay is equal to the distance divided by the speed of sound times 1,000, we're able to calculate the distance derived from this delay. But notice here, the, everything's relative off the rear subwoofer, which it has a zero delay, and everything is a higher delay from that. And then likewise, I did the reverse calculation on the Odyssey side, converted its measured distance to a time delay. And we can see there is good differences between the two, particularly that rear subwoofer. And the rear subwoofer Odyssey had as the biggest delay. So it had it at 19.2 feet or 17.07 milliseconds versus the Dirac, which is no, no delay, no distance. So this is interesting um, and we're going to see if this makes a difference when you plug in the various uh, settings. But these aren't even offset by the same amount. So we could see here, like for the rear subwoofer, um, you know, that big difference there. And then we could look at something else. Now here Dirac says the surround left and right have a 15.5 or 15.0 millisecond delay. And Odyssey, if we can convert that, it's wildly different. It's, you know, around six milliseconds. So we'll plug that in. And here are all the curtains and the crossovers uh, for each unit. And again, there's big differences in how these are set. Odyssey sets the crossovers much lower. It wants to take my front speakers, my center speakers, and my surround rear speakers, as well as top front, down to 40 hertz, whereas Dirac is 70 hertz. The curtain's a little closer, but there are some additions. One I was very concerned about with Odyssey is that rear subwoofer has a high curtain of 20,000 hertz versus the front subwoofer at 140 hertz, which is closer to what Dirac is doing, but Dirac is even lower than that. It's setting both front and rear subwoofers at 94.2 hertz, so much lower. So let's get this started up. And this time when we started up, remember the last video we said there was an update to Odyssey. It got updated on February 3rd to version 1.7.854.0. Well, this time, a week later, we started up and now it's updated again. So this brings it to 1.7.885.0. So we looked at this on February 10th, that new version. And we look at the release notes, and we can get that by going into the help and resources and get that release notes. All it's saying here is that they did some bug fixes with the base management frequencies defaulting when out of view. Here's the full release notes. I thought I put this in the last video, but maybe I didn't. But you can find this if you're in there by going to that help file, uh, and you can read all these releases. They don't put a lot of detail in these. It's particularly interesting when they come out with new features. So 1.5 was a big feature add where you could do the added EQ headroom and expanding the limits, uh, et cetera. So uh, it's always good to look to see what they're doing and they do release quite frequently. So we're gonna go back in. We already did all our measurements. We don't have to do those again. We can open an existing configuration and this is what we'll do. We select that from the drive. It brings you in here. You're not signed in yet by default. Go and hit the sign in. It will connect through Microsoft, validate your license, and then you can connect to whatever receiver or processor that uh, you want to work on. In our case, it's the 6800 from Denon. So we do that connection. We see the same um, speaker configuration as we had before. Of course, if you change your speaker configuration, you have to redo all your measurements. But in our case, we didn't move the speakers, we didn't change anything, so we can just get back in and make some modifications to all the settings. 
because we're not needing to do measurements, we're not going to go in and adjust the subwoofer levels. We don't have to go and measure uh, here, but I can show you here. I'll put a little video in. You can see here how adjusting the data smoothing impacts the visual aspects of these curbs. It doesn't do anything more than how it displays. That's uh, something I left out of the last one. So let's go back to our test plan now. We want to import a plus 4 dB Harman curve to all the channels, just like we did in Direct Live. So we get to the design target curve screen. We see the two default uh, components that they put in there. The theater high frequency roll off one, which is dipping it down just after 4K, and the mid-range compensation, which does that, two, that little dip at 2000 to compensate how the high in the mid drivers and a lot of speakers uh, don't interact well there. We're going to take all that out, although we're going to preserve, because we have two slots, the reference slot and the flat slot, where we can save the Odyssey and have them both active in the receiver at the same time. So I'm going to deselect reference and leave for high theater high frequency roll off one, just on flat for all speakers. And we're going to do the same thing for the mid range compensation, take off the reference and just leave flat. And now on the curves on the bottom there for each of the speakers, you can see a difference in the line, that green line on the front speaker. That's our reference now. And you can see it doesn't have that mid-range compensation or that roll off after 4000 hertz. Now we're ready to import the target curve. So you go up to the upper right, hit that import target button. Again, you're going to select whether reference or flat are applicable here. We're just going to do it to reference. So we'll do the opposite. We're going to deselect flat and we're going to apply it to all channels, just like we did on Dirac Live. And we're going to select our file. And it's going to be the same file we used to import to Dirac Live. This is the plus 4 dB target curve. And we'll open that file. We'll say import complete. And when you're done, you're going to see that you have a new tab here on your components. And this is showing that shelf that comes down and um, around, starts around uh, 60 hertz and drops down to uh, the lower frequency at 200. And now on your reference curves down below, you can see that green line on the front speaker. It's purple for center. I don't know why they keep switching the colors here. It would've been nice if they were consistent. And they overlap. So you have four pens here or four traces, one for left, one for right. I think sometimes right wins and sometimes left wins when there's two speakers involved. And you can see that I've applied this to all the speakers. I particularly wanted to look at the subwoofers uh, and you can see here when the subwoofer is a little different because on the low end, it just keeps on going down to 10 hertz uh, with the shelf rather than having a cutoff. So there's no low frequency cutoff because that's uh, disabled uh, by default in Odyssey. Now we can take this new curve and send it to the receiver. One thing you want to pay attention to, and it's not that you can't turn it on once this gets sent to your receiver. If you forget and you think, oh, I've just sent this to the receiver and the mult EQ is turned off, when you transferred it, it'll be off when you go to test it. So you got to then remember to go into the settings of your receiver or your processor and turn mult EQ back on. I think it's a lot easier just to turn it on here, hit enable, and then hit transfer. That way, you know, when you're going to go to use this, it's going to transfer well. And just like we did in the last video, we're not turning on dynamic volume or EQ or the low frequency containment at this time. We want to see how good this can do on its own without these extra little tricks. Of course, low frequency containment is more about making things better for your neighbors than for yourself. So when you transfer the files, it's just like before, it, it, it does the finalization of the filters. Then you select your preset. In our case, preset two is Dirac Live. I want to preserve that one because I want to keep comparing the Odyssey Mult EQ X against Dirac Live. And I want to be able to switch cleanly, nice 
in between. So I want to always keep preset two is Dirac Live. Again, you can't rename these presets with Denon Morantz. Very unfortunate because my memory is not always that good. And preset one will always keep rewriting our multi EQX exports uh, and it will leave it for the REW traces to compare the, the new versus the old measurements. So you do the transfer of the files and it sends it and it sends to the speaker configuration to the receiver or processor, finalizes the filter, and then it is complete. At this point, it disconnects the receiver or processor from the Mult EQX app. I think that's kind of nice. And that's one thing that Mult EQX does that Direct doesn't. Direct, you have to uh, disconnect. Uh, doesn't automatically disconnect when you download the filters. It stays persistent. Here, it disconnects, so you can start using the, the new filters. And then if you want to do some more edits, you can hit the reconnect button here or go back to step one, which is connect and hit that button there. So I used as a test record Van Morrison's What's Wrong With This Picture? I think that's kind of appropriate for what we're doing here. What's wrong with the Odyssey curve not looking as good as the Dirac uh, live the curve? First, we listen to it. And, well, Dirac still sounded clearly better. Um, and then with that analysis done, just listening first, we went to RAW, did our measurements, and compared. So Odyssey with a plus four Harman curve did a little better than the default curves that Odyssey puts in. But notice here, without that high frequency roll off, we're a little going up a little high there on the um, after 2000 Hertz. It does look high. I don't like that result there. Um, so maybe that roll off was good, but let's see as we go along, does that we put in all the other settings because each setting can influence the other. So we don't want to judge too early on some of this. But what I didn't notice here is that mid-range compensation that happens at 2000 hertz. By taking that away, I don't think we really heard anything. In fact, we probably helped it. Uh, and, and so it definitely dips down with that prior curve, with that default curve, which is blue. So I think taking that out, that mid-range compensation, actually helped here. So let's go back. What's the next step in our test plan? Let's go to the crossovers and the low cutoff. Now we look at this, go back to your design target curve, and we're going to go to each of the speakers. We're going to leave the target curve itself alone. We're going to go to each of the speaker groups. And the cutoff mode by default is set to auto. You can make adjustments here. You can set it to override or disable. Now disable will be no cutoff at all. We want to do a cutoff. That, that's what's going to match direct live. So we're going to hit it to override. Uh, it's going to put up this message here. I don't want to see this again. I Okay, I get it. You, you, it could cause some problems to your speakers if you put the wrong setting in. So I'm going to don't show, I'm going to, click, I'm going to click don't show this again so it doesn't bother me again and go into this. So we're in override. We can set our frequencies here and we can set it by tens. We can go 50, 60, 70, 80, but we can't go 71, 72, 73. So the granularity is 10 on the hertz. Every 10 hertz, we can set a cutoff. Second order is the default. That's how quickly it ramps up from being cut off to its full level. Uh, that seems to be right for my speakers. You want to try to match the natural curve of your speakers. Uh, if you have one that's rolling off quickly, then you want to use a higher order cutoff. But in this case, I think two is a good choice. And we do this for each and every speaker group. And I want to take a look at the end here, particularly um, for the subwoofers. Now, remember, they were disabled by default. So there's nothing to do here. Um, so we'll leave that alone. With these new cutoffs set, let's take a look at some of the other things. So if you go into filter settings, notice that base management is still auto. So 
It's not the whole story with Odyssey. They have these three things that influence each other in Odyssey, that low cutoff, uh, this base management setting here, and as well the um, curtains and how that's going to be applied. But we decided we're going to adjust one parameter at a time and how that influences. So let's go and do our transfer again. Again, making sure mul EQ is enabled by default. That will turn off if your last state was on the other speaker preset. So keep in mind uh, that. So you do your transfer. And with that complete, we did some more listening. Well, to our ears, it sounded a little better. And when we went to measure it with REW, uh, we can compare this. Now, this amplitude is a little louder. Uh, one thing we noticed is some of these changes did, without changing the level that REW was putting out, seem to boost up or lower down. So I had to go from a default of 12 dB output with REW to 20, in some cases 25. Uh, and then I had to lower it down to 10. It all depended on how those curves and everything were set in Malt EQ, which would raise or lower. So ignore maybe the amplitude, but just look at the trace here and how level it is. And this is starting to look a lot like the Dirac Live uh, trace. And we compare it against the purple line, which was the one prior. Notice all that stuff um, between 50 and 100 hertz has smoothed out. So this is certainly helping making the low cutoffs aligned with what Dirac Live does. The other thing I'm going to point out here is notice we were worried before because we took off that high frequency roll off. But when we applied these new settings, notice we don't have that rise that we had uh, on the purple chart. That seems to have leveled off now. Very interesting. So how these things are interacting can, um, even though we were playing mostly on the low frequency cutoff, we had this uh, change that occurred. Now the next test we did was, let's change the base management settings in Odyssey. Mal EQX. It's auto by default. And we switch, switch it to manual. Now we can get in and change these values. Now I found that the control that they're using in this application is a little touchy sometimes. I don't know if you're going to have the same problem. My, my computer's a little old. My Windows one. I had trouble selecting it and it wasn't, it would appear for a second and then disappear and I couldn't select the value. But ultimately I was able to get the pull down menu. These at first, on the lower frequencies, it's going by 20s, 40, 60, 80. And then it goes by 10s, 90, 100, 110, 120, and then it goes by 30. So the interval between settings isn't consistent here. I went and adjusted these to a value that was closely representing what we had in Dirac. So Dirac was 70. I couldn't do 70, so I went 60. And then it was 91. I couldn't do 91, so I went 90 and so forth. So I put the closest value in like the rear top. That was 77. I put it to 80. So again, for the closest one. The subwoofers, we don't have to do anything. So we did that transfer after making those settings. With that transfer, I thought this sounded good, maybe a little better. Um, and then when I looked at the plot with REW, this is looking pretty good. In fact, uh, this one seems to be tracing the Dirac Live almost exactly. So we've really got to this point for just for the SPL levels across frequencies, we've got Odyssey now matching Dirac Live. But it isn't checking for um, balance of all your speakers and your phase. Keep that in mind. So can we take this even farther? What if we try to match the curtains? What does this influence on the results? So when you go into the filter settings, this is number five. By default, these are all set to auto. And you can then select them to manual and change your values for your low and your high EQ limits. 
And so we've gone and done this for all this, and you can see the curtains change as you do it. And they show you the estimated results from that change. And we can do this for each speaker set, front, wides, tops, everything, rear, then ultimately the front and rear subwoofers. Now this was a big change. Notice here, this is before, this is still auto for the subwoofers we're looking at. Odyssey by its default took that front subwoofer and had a high limit of 140 Hertz. The rear one, it auto set to 20,000 Hertz. I don't know why it would ever take a subwoofer and make it go up to 20,000 Hertz. We put in the direct live settings and that's 94 on the high limit. We did it for both of them and 17 on the low. This is a more reasonable range. Now we're using the Dirac Live settings as a reference because we're trying to get it to sound as good or better than Dirac Live. If I didn't have that as a reference, if I hadn't bought Dirac Live, I would think to put it somewhere in this range. Maybe it would have been 20 hertz. Maybe it would have been 100 hertz on the upper end. But this is close, more closely represented what I would think it, it should be. So we do that transfer and we take a look at the results. And we find that now with the curtains applied, the results got worse. So we're not heading in the right direction. Notice a big jump up around 20 hertz. And it gets a little um, more disturbed um, between 100 and 500 hertz. So we were better before we put these curtain results on. Let's see what happens when we put on the trims. I mean, that still wasn't bad. It still sounded good to me. And I'm not sure I noticed the difference sonically. I'd really have to A, B those as two slots in the filter. That's the trim. Again, auto by default. If we set it to manual, we have these values and we're going to replace it with the values we have in Drac Live. We've got that all the way down through the subwoofer. And with those entered, we'll transfer those files again. And we listened and it still sounded okay, but it didn't sound as good as maybe a couple of attempts before. And the graph here is kind of showing here it's starting to fall apart more, particularly around that 90 hertz, it's making a big dip. So we're not heading in a good direction. And now we've got this problem again on the high frequencies, which shooting off, right? So it's it's boosting on the high end. So it sounded more harsh uh, when I listened to it. The next thing we looked at was distances or in Dirac, it's the time delay. I mean, ultimately it's always time delay is what it's doing. It's just how it's reporting it to the user interface. So we do the same thing. It's, it's set to auto by default on the calibration settings, number six. And we turn those to manual and we put in the distances. Now this is the converted distance from millisecond delay to feet. In our case, it could be meters, but you do that speed of sound conversion and you get these values and you enter them in. You make sure this is done all the way through every speaker group. You transfer those files and you listen and you think, okay, doesn't sound that bad. This is a little better than what we had before, but maybe not quite as good to back to where we had it just with the curtains and not the distances or the trims, but definitely better than just the trims alone. So I thought, well, if the trims seem to be the worst one, what if we took the trims out, but we just put the distances in? And that was back to the same problems as it was just the trims. So tr distance alone, trims alone, we have this big dip that comes down. We put them together with the direct live and the result is better, but maybe not as good as doing everything. And I think this has a lot to do with the fact that Odyssey is doing their levels and their distances differently than Dirac. It's a different thought process and maybe they're just not compatible. Right? Maybe you just have to do it, trust the Odyssey distances and trims, at least as a starting point. We end up with steps A through D on the test plan, all having positive outcomes, each improving on the other. And we felt that the trims and the distances, the time delays, 
matching that of Dirac Live had more of a negative effect. So if we back those out, we just show the best curve from Dirac Live base control and the best curve we got to date from Odyssey Multi EQX. We superimpose them on each other and they're very similar. Now with AB listening tests between these two, I can still hear differences. So it's, we got to look further than just the SPL ratings. And this is where I think time delay may have an influence why I still think the Dirac Live is clearly better, but Malt EQ is sounding so much better than it did with the default settings. So let's summarize all this up. Here's my comparison summary so far. Price-wise, okay, Odyssey Multi-EQX, you're going to save money, right? You got full bandwidth, you got multi-sub, all for $200, albeit the multi-sub isn't really the base control that Dirac Live is doing. So the feature sets aren't quite the same, but you do save a lot of money. Question on licensing. Can you transfer your license to another unit? The answer is no for both of these. If you do have a hardware failure, so if this 6800 fails and Denon sends me a new one, they will transfer the license for that in each case. Call them, they help you out. But can you transfer it to another owner? So if I have purchased it and I want to sell the 6800 to somebody else, the answer is no for Odyssey Malt EQX but it's yes for Dirac Live that transfers to the new owner. So there's a difference there. They're both external applications as opposed to built-in Odyssey. Windows support, they both have Windows support, but only Dirac Live gives you Mac OS support. Now usability, I did think there was a big difference. And from a high level, you know, I just felt that Dirac Live was much more easy to use, less intimidating. It walks you through the steps versus Mult EQ is a little more intimidating for me. I have to learn a lot and they have multiple settings that influence each other. And I found it very confusing. So the one place where I thought Mult EQX was easier was setting the sub levels. And you just essentially center that on that chart and you go to the back of your sub or wherever you turn the volume for your sub and get it in between that line. I feel that the way that Dirac Live goes about level setting for all your speakers, and it's not just the subs, you got to do it for every speaker. It takes a while to master. And you have to understand like, oh, what do I set my mic to? What do I set my output gain to? And then how do I... Now it's not a critical item. They're just trying to get those pretty close so that it doesn't have to stretch so far when it does the final calibration. If you don't have those levels in range, Direct Live will stop the measurement process and you have to go through and go back and adjust your levels again. So I think that is the clunkiest part of the Dirac Live setup is getting those levels established. Once you do that, it's pretty easy because it guides you through everything. And I think a lot of the defaults that it's picking for the crossovers and the curtains are a lot more reasonable. I think they're closer to what I would have picked on my own or maybe even better than what I picked on my own. So this is where I felt like it did better with the target curves and the base management and the curtains and everything. Now I didn't color code those because there is probably some variability based on your room and all that. So it did well for me, but will it do for you as well? So we'll, we'll let you color code this on your own. But from my experience, I thought that the Dirac Live made it a lot easier on those items. And well, the target curves in Odyssey, there's a lot of options there. They have all these things that you can insert for components to help you achieve that curve that you want. But the built-ins, the ones that they include, I felt you don't really need. At least the mid-bass for the most part. It's a toolbox without having 
the master there to help you along the way. That's the way I, I look at it. The base management, all come. you got this low cutoff, you've got the curtains, and then you've got the base management stuff on the, at the end with the speakers large and small. And what's your crossover that's in the base management? Why do I have a low cutoff and a crossover? It just seems a lot more simple in Dirac Live and the results are better. So I don't mind complex if you need complex to get good results, but it doesn't seem like you need complex to get it good. So the results, I got poor results when I used default settings from the Odyssey Mult EQX. Let me know if you got really good results from those defaults, because it could just be my room. What I found with Dirac is the defaults got you good results. And then you could just fine tune it. So I felt like, oh, I just wanted to boost the bass a little bit. That's where I put that Harman curve in there that boosted up four dBs. And I was good after that. Now, with the custom settings, you're able to achieve good results. We were able to match the same. We could get very close to Dirac performance by doing the custom. My knowledge of what that should be set to came from Dirac. So if I didn't have direct, I don't know how I would come up with them. Although I'd probably just give my best guess as I've been saying along here. With direct, it's just so simple edits and, and to take you to that next level. With Odyssey, you do have full manual operations and you have this ability to import EQ that you've done with other tools like REW. It's something you can't do with direct live is bring in your REW. Uh, results. I don't know of a way at least. But you can import a target curve into both of them. But uh, And then with Direct Live, you can manually adjust your target curve and you can put more points in there and, and move it. But the tools you have beyond this bar that you raise on the high and the low frequencies isn't as many templates or tools that are built into Odyssey. So I'll let you be the judge there, but this is where I saw the differences. So what are your thoughts? Now, are you willing to spend more for Dirac Live for maybe a, a better user experience and um, getting you to the results more quickly without having to do a lot of customization? Or are you such that you don't mind the defaults that are in Odyssey or you don't mind doing the tinkering and doing the custom settings to save that money, that several hundred dollars less, uh, what are your thoughts there? That feedback would be useful to RipeWave Audio community. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. If you want to take your participation to the next level, we have a Patreon channel at www.patreon.com slash RipeWave. Of course, you can always give a one-time donation with the thanks button. Of course, it doesn't cost a thing to hit that bell notification so you're notified when the next video is posted. Until then, keep evolving your audio experience.